This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf. It's been quite a year. From the release of the Mueller report to the impeachment proceedings against President Trump, the swirl of stories and competing political narratives has, at times, felt overwhelming. In the next 30 minutes, we're going to unpack those stories and name our story of the year with the help of an old friend. He's Dr. Michael Kennedy this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salvador Virginia University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, scholars, artists, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Dr. Michael Kennedy, a professor of sociology and international and public affairs at Brown University. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. Mm, it's my pleasure. So we wanted to stipulate up front sort of the recognition that this panel today is particularly male, stale, and pale. All right, so we try on the show every week to try to resemble uh, what the country looks like one episode at a time, and sometimes we wind up with three white guys uh, on, on camera. So I'm curious, you know, you, 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 you drew this attention to, our attention to this yesterday uh, when we were talking before the show. Why is that so important? Well, it's generally important, but it's really topical right now. I mean, um, I don't know if y'all saw Michael Harriet at The Root. He wrote this really provocative essay about Pete Buttigieg based on a 2011 broadcast in which he was sitting with three other white guys and one of the things that happens is when white folks get together, we often reproduce the stories white folks know. And so even this idea of what's important this year, well, what's important for white folks may not be the same as what's important for the rest of the right, country, of much less the rest of the world. So I appreciate this yeah. recognition. No, it's a fair point, and it's something that we're, we're absolutely mindful of. Uh, but we do have a lot of things that we want to talk to uh, talk to you about uh, from 2019. And let's start with, I think, you know, the, 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 the story that I think has dominated the, the bulk of the media coverage this year, and it's the possible impeachment of, of President Trump. There are a lot of narratives that have circulated uh, in, in this space, and I think some, you might say, are, are more true than others. Can you unpack the, some of those narratives yeah. for us? So I think this is, when I teach introductory sociology, I even talk about the sociology of Trump. And the old stories that we used to tell about what sociology is have changed, in part because of the status of truth has changed. So, in fact, the Intelligence Committee uh, just put out their report. Uh, but there are two stories associated with that report. There's a Democrat story and a Republican story. The Democrat story, you know, is based on all of these witnesses, all of this evidence, creating a coherent narrative alongside a theory of what Trump is, maybe a demagogue, maybe someone threatening democracy. The Republicans have a completely different story. They'll look at each individual case, spin an alternative tale about each of those cases, and not try to establish any more coherence other than Trump is someone who we ought to revere, his power is awesome, and we want to magnify it. These two stories, don't go together, and this is why this impeachment is such a troubling time, a critical time for our country. Is there any historical precedent for that completely divergent point of view, the two completely different narratives? And you're right, they, they are in stark contrast. See, I mean, it's almost like we're, right. they, we're looking at two different, two different events, not the same events, right. meaning the impeachment hearings and the process. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about whether there is precedent. Because we can say, obviously, there's terrific precedent if you think about the ways in which the color line has divided America. W.E.B. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folk talked about the ways in which there was a white America and there was a black America separated by a veil. We could say that we are also separated 
by that veil today because there is a kind of whiteness to Trump's support and certainly those who oppose Trump are disproportionately people of color, especially black women. So one of the things that we should be thinking about as we're thinking about these two narratives is their historical roots, but at the same time, the ways in which current technologies, especially this proliferation of media, winds up augmenting already divisive politics in this country. And social media being part of media, of social course. Social media, but also, you know, it's... it's the mainstream media. Ah, yeah. MSM. I yes. finally got that hashtag down. <laughs> <laughs> that hashtag is, where is that most popular? It's most popular among Trump supporters. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. It's an epithet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you, you raise this issue, though, of sort of the different experiences of Americans dependent upon uh, their race and their perspective on various issues. One of the things that I think has alarmed a lot of Americans this year has been the treatment uh, of, of immigrants coming into this country. And refugees. And refugees. Yeah. Um, uh, people uh, uh, seeking a better life for themselves and often their children uh, are winding up in detention facilities and uh, overcrowded detention facilities. Uh, children being separated from their parents' practice, which continues to this day. You know, there's a question for me in my mind about how will history view Trump, uh, but the other issue I think is how will history view the rest of us? Yeah. So, I mean, when I think about this, I, th I begin with that two narrative story, because Trump is telling one story and those who oppose his policy on the border is telling another story. Trump is telling a story about build the wall. Now that's not an effective border control policy, but it is metaphorically powerful because it gives Trump and his supporters a chance to say, ah, he's saving our nation. But who is our, you know, in that story, right? Who is people like us in that story? And so one of the things that I'm struck by is the degree to which there are many people today who may not identify with immigrants, who may not identify with refugees, who may not identify with migrants, but they are seeing them as part of their community. I'm struck by, for example, the number of police officers who say, we have to prioritize taking care of our community. That means that everyone has to trust us to come to us about violations of the law. But if they're always afraid that we're going to turn them into the ice, that's not satisfactory. Right. So it's one more point in this, well, two more points in this regard. The first is, I teach a course on engaged scholarship at Brown, associated with the Swearer Center and the Sociology Department. And one of the things that a very interesting guy, a guy named Bob Cohen, he was an activist in the 60s and 70s around civil rights and labor. He came into the class and the students asked him, if you were a student today, where would you be putting your energies? And he would say, certainly in support of all of these most vulnerable people, migrants, refugees, and the people who ICE are taking. And I would, in this case, even engage in direct action to put me first, take me first, rather than them. The last thing I'll say is that here I was just focusing on Trump, focusing on their, you know, the people who oppose this policy. But I think it's so easy to lose sight of these children and families who are being devastated. In anticipation of the show, I was looking at different things. And the president of the American Medical Association said, how is it possible? that in this country, we are treating children and families like this. Their health is not a question of whether they are a citizen or not. Their health is a matter of a human right, and we and, should and, respect it. And that. yet this, this continues. There was, a, there was a lot of attention paid during the summer in terms of media reports, and then it has kind of gone beneath the surface again. Why does that happen? Such a critical issue. Six months later, you barely read about I think this or is, hear about. This is horrific. Or learn about. This is horrific. And, you know, when you were asking about historians, people are going to try to explain why Trump did as he did. Yeah. But people are going to ask, how did the American public allow this? Yeah. And that's I know the people question. who go down, yeah. you know, politicians go down, normal folks go down, translators go down, medical people go down. But it's not like we are stepping up in defense of these vulnerable people. I'm afraid we know the answer to that question. 
What is it? I'm afraid that we know the answer to the question, how did the American public let this happen? What? This, no, this, seriously, we, 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 I don't we, know what that well, is. Well, we, we, we've seen uh, time and again in history that um, you uh, construct a, boogie, uh, a boogeyman, you construct a, a, a scapegoat, you construct uh, a, a threat to identity, uh, real or imagined, uh, that um, great sins can be committed in the name of that. And that, that, that's, that's not just an American story, that's, no. that's And there's a, an a economic history. factor here too. Absolutely, absolutely. But let's talk for a minute too about American foreign policy because 2019 was a year of, of, of I think, big news, even if it didn't get the kind of attention that it would in a, in a typical presidency. Uh, big shifts in American foreign policy in the Middle East in particular. Uh, the withdrawal of uh, U.S. forces from Syria, uh, well, in particular from support of, of, of our Kurdish allies in northern Syria. Is there such a thing as a coherent approach to American foreign policy now? So that's a really good question. I would say that there is American foreign capriciousness <laughs> if Trump is involved because, you know, his approach to foreign policy is about the art of the deal. And if you look at all the things that he celebrates, like dealing with North Korea and being the first president to go to North, U.S. president to go to North Korea in 2019, right. that's a, an accomplishment. Dealing with China and these trade wars, making these deals with uh, the Mexican president to create a new asylum policy, all of these things are about his doing something. But for me, policy has to be coherent. Policy has to be consistent. Otherwise, it's not policy. It's just capricious. Well, but but also real. I mean, so North Korea is still testing ballistic missiles, right? And and they don't have the range to reach the United States, but they have the range to reach our allies and our forces in the region. Right. Uh, the, the 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 trade deal with uh, Mexico has still not been ratified by by uh, Mexico and Canada has still not been ratified by Congress. Uh, there's a long list of things that the president says he's done. The trade deal with China, we still haven't actually seen it. We've heard that it's coming. We've heard that it might happen by the end of the year, but we still don't know what's in it. We don't know that it's actually any better than what he began with. And so, you know, I, I don't want to get too much on the soapbox here, but there's just a disconnect between the things that we're told are happening and what our own eyes are showing us. Well, you know, it, it, it's like immigration. There's a big splash of news when the president meets with the head of North Korea, which is substantial, a landmark event, big news, and then what happens afterwards just get, gets lost. I mean, do we have too much information? Is there too much in our world for one person to really keep track of? There's always been too much for one person to take care of. So we need to have the narratives that organize it for us. Yeah. And here's the problem, once again. If we talk about foreign policy, we'll talk about you know, making America great again, making America strong again, and being able to negotiate with tough guys. But you don't look at the consequences, and this is, and this is where we need to focus. Because if you're talking about policy, you're thinking about effect. If you're talking about a deal, you're thinking about the outcome immediately, yeah. right? And that's all publicity. So one of the things that I, that I think we ought to do at the end of 2019 is to take stock of where America is in the world. We may have improved our position vis-a-vis -vis Putin. We may have improved our position vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan by pulling out. And in fact, this debacle of this withdrawal from north in, northeastern Syria, abandoning Kurdish allies, this is a great gift to Putin and Erdogan because if you're a realist, this is the evisceration of American influence in the Middle East. Right. If you're a humanitarian, this is a disaster for all of these Kurdish peoples and all democratically struggling, aspiring people in the region. So it's, I'm ashamed of this policy in particular, but I'm also so distressed by the, what Trump has done to American foreign policy in terms of our experts, in terms of our State Department and our security establishment. You can find so many stories in the press and even the GOP doesn't want to talk about it because in fact they are also embarrassed but they have to be beholden to the great it's, the, it's an attack on expertise and people who are professionals and competent at these things, right? That's right. Um, I want to I want to switch to another issue because there's so much more that we that we want to uh, talk to you about today. Um, there have been a wave of popular protests 
all over the world. We think about events in Hong Kong, events in Iran, events even in Russia uh, and in South America uh, and in France. You think about the Yellow Vest protests. Um, is there connective tissue? Is there, is there a through line on all of these different protests, geographically dispersed, economically and politically dispersed? Is there a through line uh, that we ought to look up and possibly see in this some sort of global moment? So, no and yes. <laughs> so usually kind of you say yes and no, but it's no and yes. So you have satisfied everyone. With it. But I mean, here's here's the here's the challenge. We're accustomed to looking for through lines by virtue of coherent ideologies and touchstones. Yeah. We could th talk about third world liberation movements at one time. We could talk about socialist movement at one time. We could even talk about the movement for democracy at one time. None of those things are operative today, right? Each of these struggles has their own idiom, cultural idiom. Each of these struggles has their own particular contest. However, there are sociologists around the world who are doing really interesting work by, in this sense. They're trying to understand the struggles in their context, but then also thinking about how they connect to other struggles. Because you're not going to see people having the same cultural frame but you will see things that resonate. So instead of thinking about having these as all a common category, we could see them all as having a family resemblance. And the family resemblance is this. First, the world is more unequal than it's ever been. It's more unequal than it's ever been across the world. And all of these protests, except maybe for Hong Kong, all of these protests are fundamentally about inequality, but they don't recognize their commonality. The second thing, though, we can put Hong Kong into the story if we were to think about the dignity of individuals, if we were to think about the dignity of communities. And the question is, and this is what the big sociological question is, can we find a way of framing all of these contests in terms of a struggle for dignity and the struggle for community that recognizes one another's difference and also a common struggle against a system that impoverishes and endangers us. The system in which we live may not survive, and it's not because that system will die, it's because the planet can die. Sounds like that is the connected tissue. You said there's been work on this by sociologists. Yes. And what do they conclude? So, clearly, I mean, the environmental catastrophe the ecological crisis in which we're living, that we are, is only going to, we are living in that now. And it's only going to get worse. So that is the connective tissue, but not everyone sees that. And so one of the things that I want to, you know, look for is, for instance, Trump's supporters. They are profoundly alienated from the system. They look at the deep state. They don't look at the deep ecological crisis. But they could, because they see their communities being destroyed by environmental dangers, but instead their attention is redirected elsewhere. You're thinking perhaps of West Virginia coal country, Kentucky coal country. That's right. So that brings us to climate change, which was another one of the big issues that we wanted to talk about. The UN issued recently another report that warns of that we're really in trouble, deep, deep trouble. Is there anything that we can do, meaning first the US, and second, the planet, to forestall or to prevent complete disaster, which is what the science is telling us is going to happen in terms of flooding, in terms of storms, in terms of migration, in terms of people moving across and out of areas into other areas. What can be done? Anything? We don't have a choice. But we, ha we have to do everything but there, and more. But right? there, there isn't the political will in this country to do it. No. So how do we get that political will? I mean, this isn't now a question of like in 100 years or 40 That's generations right. or whatever. This That's is right. within our lifetime. That's right. Even people of our age, and certainly younger people, it's well within their lifetime. So this is this interesting space, I feel like. You know, our generation is not accustomed to paying attention to youngers very much. Too much on the cell phone, too much of this, too much of that. I know, it's just <laughs> derogatory. <laughs> but there's of. something profoundly right about saying that you, we are betraying them. Yeah. We I totally are agree. betraying them. 
And I remember there was a man named uh, who would come to Providence, the former president of Chile, Ricardo Lagos. I would often ask him, how is it possible, since you are yourself a political leader and he's so environmentally concerned, how is it possible to create this shift? And he would say in his kind, grandfatherly way, Michael, you have to talk to people as if they are doing something to their grandchildren. They don't care about other people's grandchildren, but they care about their own. And we have to hear that. And I think, you know, it's great that Greta Thunberg is one of these young people speaking, but there mm. are so many. In fact, I was just looking the other day. There's Redima Pandi, uh, Kaluki Pal Mutuku, Nina Galinga, Autumn Peltier, Leah Namugera, so many young people. Maybe we should pay a little more well, attention. Well, I often say right? I put my faith in the young. And so that brings us to the purpose for this particular episode, the announcement of the public narrative that has the, had the biggest impact on public affairs in the previous 12 months. This year, the story of the year, as we call it, is not a single story itself, but rather a phenomenon, the fracturing of public narrative. The truth is, the broad outlines of this story have been visible for decades. In the aftermath of the Second World War and at the height of newspaper circulation in the United States, there were three nightly outlets for national broadcast news three respected elder journalists who shaped the public's consciousness even while they did their best to remain dispassionate. Today we get our television news from entertainment companies, while many of us spend more time engaging with news on social media. As a result, there is no longer a national narrative to help guide policymakers. There is increasingly not even an agreed upon set of facts. Look no further than the president's impeachment defense, which relies upon a set of talking points the president's own former senior advisor on Russia warned in sworn testimony before Congress was nothing more than Russian disinformation. In the absence of facts we can all agree upon or an American narrative we can all accept, the public retreats into partisan positions ready to do battle with or worse ostracize anyone who sees the world differently. In the mid-1920s, a French essayist and philosopher by the name of Julian Benda looked at the political press of his time and warned that in its zeal to stoke partisan passions, the press was betraying the ideals of the West and setting the stage for another great war. Nearly 100 years later, we have balkanized the American narrative so grievously that in the past year we've seen the American Attorney General mischaracterize a two-year investigation of the President, effectively muting the investigation's conclusions. This past summer, the White House redrew a National Hurricane Center map with a Sharpie. Literally. And now we have an impeachment investigation in which the president's allies dismiss the proceedings whose most damning witnesses have all worked at the pleasure of the president as a so-called deep state conspiracy. Self-government in a republic such as ours requires deliberation and debate, even passionate debate. But the success of self-government requires agreement about basic facts and a belief that the truth is knowable through reason. And so with some sense of trepidation, we name the story of the year for 2019 the fracturing of America's public narrative. So, Michael, that's a lot. I'm wondering, though, your thoughts about, you know, the opportunity. Is there a space? Is there, is there any potential for America returning to a shared narrative? Well, let me flip the question. I mean, because if there's any space, we might say public radio, public television, ought to be that. It ought to be that. So let me put it to you. Looking back on 2019, for your own guess, where do you say the greatest common public space could have been? Good question. We've had a lot of people from the political world and the academic world. I would say that our guests who represent mental health issues brought a commonality. Uh, we had a guest, Peter Blank, who is a disability rights lawyer and advocate who brought commonality. Two examples of issues and people that transcend party affiliation, that transcend economic stature in, in your community. And we've had other guests like that. We had a poet by the name of Maggie Smith, who was wonderful, who also in her poetry brought people together or does seek to bring people together and, and it and it works so we've had that kind of guest absolutely I think in some respects it's a great question and I think in some respects that what we've seen is that when uh, we get sucked into the 
the, the, the topical issues that are driven out of Washington, there's a natural retreat into partisan perspectives. Yeah. And I think it happens on the set. I think that it happens in our public uh, engagements with people. I think that it happens around our kitchen tables. Uh, and, 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 and so I don't know if this is a function of Trump, but I've been around for the last 25, 30 years. And really since the mid 1990s, this has been the defining characteristic of American politics. And I don't know what the solution is. I think we could say that shared humanity, when you sit and talk with someone eye to eye, whatever your political beliefs are, and see the person and spend time with the person, I think that gives us some hope that we can reach a commonality. It's when we retreat to our silos. I hate that word, but yeah. I always use it. Our silos, our social media sites, our Fox News or our MSNBC, our Rachel Maddow, whatever it happens to be. Those are safe places for people who believe as those outlets do. Sometimes you have to come out of those safe places and you can't do it on social media. It simply is not possible. You can't do it on Facebook. You can't, I mean, you can't to an extent, but you know what I'm saying. There's nothing like what we're doing here right now, sitting and talking and having a conversation around a table. And I think it's harder to be nasty to people Much when you harder. look them in the eye as opposed to sending them a tweet. I don't like that tie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it either. It's a lovely tie. <laughs> well, yours isn't that great. I just want to say, for the record. But, so, I think there are two things that I would say. You know, We've got to say them quick, though. Say them quick. The first thing is, is that there is a face-to-face -face reality, but there's also, let's pick the issues that we go face-to-face -face in and try to create a common space. The second thing is that this is not a substitute for making sure that the agenda is right. Because some issues where we come together exclude people for too readily. That's a great place to leave it. Michael Kennedy, thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week. If you want to know more, check us out on Facebook or Twitter. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time on Story in the Public Square. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf.